Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Family Caregiver Alliance for what every caregiver should know about downsizing, decluttering, and getting organized. This webinar is open to caregivers and professionals. CEUs are available through the Board of Behavioral Sciences. To obtain your continuing education credit for your MFT, LCSW, LEP, and LPCC license, please email chu at caregiver.org with your name, license number, and type if you haven't already done so. My name is Calvin Hu, and I'm the Education Coordinator at FCA and your host. For nearly 40 years, Family Caregiver Alliance has been working to improve the well-being of family caregivers that are providing long-term care. We offer caregiver support through classes, workshops, publications, retreats, research, and advocacy. You can visit us at www.caregiver.org. For the duration of the presentation, your phones will be muted. If you have any questions, you can ask them by going to the GoToWebinar question box on your screen. We'll answer questions at the end of the presentation. Um, also, at the completion of the webinar, um, you're going to be asked to give some feedback, and we use this for shaping future education programs. So I'd like to thank you in advance for filling those out. We always love to hear from you. Today, I'd like to introduce Susie Marsh, who is our guest for this month's webinar. Uh, Susie is a professional uh, organizer and owner of Susie's Organization Solutions, which the initials are SOS, um, located in Michigan. She was born and raised a Michigander and started her organizing business in 2007. Susie is also a licensed social worker in the state of Michigan and has worked in mental health for over 25 years. So as a professional organizer, uh, Susie's job is to help eliminate chaos and clutter in residential settings. Uh, what you would expect, but also things like uh, vehicles. Um, also, what's uh, rather unique about Susie and why we're pretty excited to have her on is that she brings some unique qualifications to her work. Uh, as I mentioned, she is an experienced social worker, and what that means is she's able to, in particular, work with uh, older adults and people with uh, mental or physical challenges. Susie also has a long history of working with caregivers. She's been a member of the Caregiver Resource Network since 2003. She's also a member of the National Association of Professional Organizers, the Michigan chapter and the national chapter, the Institute for Challenging Disorganization, Organizers for Charity, and the Byron Center Chamber of Commerce. Um, also, if you uh, like cable television, and I have to admit, uh, I do like a bit of cable television, you might recognize Susie from the TV show Hoarders. Um, she's one of the experts that they uh, bring on. So now that you know a little bit more about our guest today, I'd like to turn things over to Susie. All right. Thank you very much, Calvin. Um, thanks, for everybody, for spending the next hour with me. I really appreciate it. And um, I just wanted to let you know as well that um, I've also been a caregiver, and I know what a hard job that's been. Um, I, I took care of my parents before they um, had their illnesses and passed away, and then most recently my uncle, who was a lifelong bachelor, um, he needed some assistance um, in the home before he actually passed away, and then I was in charge of his whole estate. So I come at it from a personal and professional perspective. So, um, But today we're going to talk about downsizing, decluttering, and getting organized. And um, usually I start out when I'm talking to my live crowds, I'll say, um, anybody out there with clutter? So raise your hand if anybody has a, a, a problem with clutter, and I think I'm probably going to see some virtual hands going up there. So, <laughs> um, but you come to the right place. So we're going to talk some more about this. Um, and also, just uh, so you know, um, apply this to yourself as a caregiver or to your own personal life, because some of these things may, um, you know, will carry over to, to both both um, you personally and then the person you're caregiver for. So, okay, um, so I, I have a list of questions here which um, kind of gets, gets you thinking about what, um, what, what it is to um, downsize, declutter, and get organized. So the first one is, do you long to have a more simple life? Uh, do you just want to be free of the stuff and the responsibility of taking care of it? Uh, number two, are you constantly looking for lost or misplaced items? Um, you know, most most typically, people are looking for their keys, their wallet, their purse, that kind of thing. Um, can be really irritating when you can't put your hands on them when you need them. Uh, number three, are you rebuying items, wasting your money because you can't find the items you were looking for? 
a lot of times that can be like your clothing. You know, you keep buying the same kind of stuff over again because you can't quite find what you're looking for. Um, or it's like, I know I had that pine saw bottle sitting somewhere. Where is it? So I have the store and i got to go buy some more. Uh, number four, can you find your important documents easy? You know, would that be like your, your banking um, or your, your budget, your bills, your insurance papers, things you have to have on hand? Um, can you find those? Number five, are your personal relationships affected because there's too much clutter in your home? Um, are you fighting with your spouse um, or a significant other over the amount of clutter that's in your spaces? Is it starting to impede on other places in the home and this is causing some friction? Is the stuff taking place of people? Um, on the next slide, we'll have um, number six. Do you have too much brain clutter? Um, do you have um, something called attention um, deficit disorder where you have distractibility? Um, do you have a lack of order in your day-to-day -day life that just um, you don't have a really good time management um, system? Number seven, are you ready to, to let go and declutter and downsize your current home? Maybe it's just too big for you now. Maybe you're in a life transition. You've had, you're an empty nester or um, you just just feel like it's just too much of a house to, to, to take care of now. And number eight, do you feel depressed or anxious thinking about all the clutter and chaos around you? Does it feel overwhelming to, to see everything around and know that um, you, you have to either deal with it or it's just going to keep piling up? Number nine, is it harder for you to keep your house organized and clutter-free because of the physical or mental limitations? So maybe you've had a chronic illness, maybe you've had cancer, um, you know, ALS, maybe you have bad knees, bad back, and it just, you know, when you hit the door, when you walk in at the end of the day and the bags go down right there, um, you know, because you don't have the energy to, to keep moving those items on to where they need to go. And number 10, are you in a life transition such as moving to a senior community or a relative's home or to a smaller home? So those big life transitions, um, can be a, a big challenge just knowing what to do with all of those items that you've accumulated over 40, 50, 60 years in your current setting. So on the next page, we have treasures or trash. So you're, do you remember the, the, the quote out there, one, per, one person's trash is another person's treasure? Well, these are actually um, items that I've come across working with some of my clients over the past years. And, you know, when you um, are sifting through all of your items, maybe you've been in your house, like I said, 60 years, and you've come across these, and you're like, oh, well, I remember that set, that Magic Doll set, or um, that was my Red Cross uniform from World War II, or that's the Life magazines after um, JFK was assassinated. So to some people, they don't see that as um, anything valuable, but others may. So in the um, sorting process, you kind of have to weigh that out and maybe get some experts involved in that. All right, next slide. We're going to talk about the downsizing, organizing to-dos. And all these um, pictures and photos that I have all throughout the, uh, the slideshow here, um, except for the ones that are like clip art, they're, they're from the actual jobs that I've worked on with, with clients and their families. And so it gives you real, <laughs> real on the... Uh, um, uh, I guess, you know, the photos of what actually um, we're coming across. Okay, so the downsizing, organizing, to do. So start early. That is like the main thing to, to start early, especially if you're going to be in a life transition, like maybe you're um, thinking about moving the loved one to a senior community. Um, or maybe you're moving them into the home with you then you really have to think about, you know, what the sizes of the house that they're in and how much stuff there is there to take care of. Um, so you start, start that downsizing process at least 12 to 18 months prior to the move. Um, don't let it be an emergency situation where you back up a truck and say, take it all because I can't deal with this. Um, that's like one of my biggest worries when I'm working on the job with, with a family and maybe that their loved one has all of a sudden had a medical crisis and it's time for that um, family to kind of decide what they're going to do uh, with all of the, the personal items in the home. 
now if you're a family that's that's um, talking and you know getting along together, your close family, you know most times things can go okay, pretty smoothly. But it does still take a lot of time to go through the items and get get it figured out who's going to do what. Um, in other situations, maybe the families are not getting along, or you have a long distance um, caregiving relationship. You have one one um, family member that's close to the, the the person that needs the care, and the other person is on the, the west coast. So you're gonna you're you know kind of have the, those two things going, and the responsibility falls onto one person. So uh, you know you may have some some conflict going there. You know, so a lot of everybody's situation is different, um, as you guys all realize, I'm sure. Um, but the worst case scenario for me is, you know, just backing up the truck and, you know, it all gets hauled away and, you know, if it goes to the dump, you know, it's not really benefiting anybody else as far as donation sites. And it's not benefiting the family by, you know, being passed down and, um, as far as history. Um, the next point is talk to your loved ones about downsizing. Um, is it due to getting older, the house is too big, uh, medical or mental challenges? or just wanting to simplify. Um, you may be a caregiver that's in the home taking care of your um, elderly parent and you're just seeing that, you know, it's a struggle for them to do the day-to-day -day things now. Um, the house is big, so now maybe you're having to, um, you know, have companies come in and do the work, let's say, doing the landscaping around the house or, you you know, you have a home care provider person coming in. Um, and you've been maybe been doing that for years, um, but now it's to the point where um, more care is needed, and then you're, now you're looking at other options out there. So, just sitting down as a family and talking it through um, can really be helpful, um, especially when it comes to downsizing. Um, and then start thinking about giving items to family and friends now, so that you can enjoy them enjoying the items. So there, there's no rule out there that says that you know people have to wait until they pass away to, to pass their, their items on to family members. Um, I personally have an aunt who has decided every Christmas time to give us as the, um, the next generation uh, items that were from my grandparents. So it was like an egg tray that we remember seeing every Easter that's come out, um, you know, and I, and it, she would bring it um, out, you know, for special occasions kind of thing. And so now it, it was given to me at Christmas time. So now I have that plate, which I'm bringing out and showing to, to the rest of the family members and rem reminiscing. Um, she doesn't inundate us with a lot of items, which is great because I don't need any clutter either in my house. But, um, you know, she's uh, very respectful and she asks us, you know, if this is something we would be interested in and, and then we go from there. So just um, having that conversation about giving those items to the family and friends. Now I know the lot, you know, with the older generation, there tends to be a lot of china and glassware, all that kind of stuff is, is really um, not very, um, I guess, treasured by the younger generation now because they don't tend to uh, have parties and um, just entertain like that. So. You know, sometimes there's that that conflict between the older and younger generation because they're like, well, why don't you want to have my items? And and the younger generation is like, well, I don't want to have to store it, and I don't really know what to do with it. Um, and you know, so it ends up being donated, which is fine. Um, you see those a lot in the antique stores right now, um, a lot of china and glassware, things like that. But if you have a place for it and you feel like you would like to give it um, to that 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 family member that would uh, really appreciate it, then I say go for it. Um, the next point is think about how much space you'll have in the new spaces or new, newly organized spaces. So the first thing is you got to measure. You have to measure your spaces so you know exactly how much room you have. So let's say you have a family member that's moving in with you because you're the caregiver for them um, and you're giving them um, a bedroom, a bathroom, and you know, a storage closet, let's say, um, to use. Well, if they had a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house that they're coming from, obviously a lot of that that um, personal effects, you know, their, their things from their home is not going to fit in their new spot. 
So you really have to figure out what are the important pieces that are going to go with you. So if you have room for one dresser, um, you have room for your bed, you have room for um, maybe some of your little knickknacks that, that you've acquired over the years that are special to you. Um, and then maybe even if you have a chance to put things into storage, it's always a good thing to um, just figure out those spaces and what is really going to make sense for you to have. All right, the next one is uh, do your items have a purpose and a place? Well, this is the one thing most all of my clients hear from me all the time, purpose and place. Uh, that is going to really make you think the next time you walk into an antique store and you see a whole bunch of items out there that maybe have some, um, I, I guess, maybe makes you think about times long ago that maybe you've had with your family. Um, but do you really have a purpose or a place for that item to go? Are you willing to let that item uh, take the place of something in your home currently that's there? Um, that's called what the in and out rule. So if something comes in, something goes out. So there isn't like that stack of items that's going to accumulate. Uh, I think in our culture where we have a lot of material, materialism, that, that tends to be very difficult for people. To, uh, to do that because, you know, that accumulation, that status, that I have this, I have that, um, tends to be ingrained in, in, the, in the generations, um, and especially the younger generation where it's kind of, they're known as the me, <laughs> me, me, me generation. So uh, that's just, uh, definitely something that has to be thought about whenever you're thinking about bringing something new in, you want to think about having something else go out and making sure it has a purpose in your home. And then you want to look at how can you utilize all of the available and valuable spaces in my home. So looking at vertical spaces, do you, um, do you use all the wall spaces or the upper shelves um, in closets? Are you using that for things that are less used? Um, are you looking at ceilings like in the garage where we can have the, the drop down kind of storage spaces? Um, you also want to look at your low spaces. Do you um, have I, you know, have you do you have the ability to put like um, storage bins under your bed or shoe organizers under your bed? They have risers now that you can put under the four corners of your bed that'll rise it up, and you will have a chance to use that storage under there. Um, you also want to uh, make sure that you're using you know underneath cabinet space if there's room for for storage of um, maybe platters things like that under china cabinets. I've seen people do that quite a bit. And um, it just makes sense to, you know, make sure you have them in a nice, you know, uh, something that, you know, they're not going to get broken in, you know, that they're, they're well um, buffered, you know, with the, the popping bubble thing um, or whatever that works for you. Um, and then using multifunctional furniture uh, serving more than one purpose. So like having trunk, um, they I've seen lots of people, including myself, use trunks as coffee tables, and then they also can use the inside of that to store maybe extra pillows, blankets. Um, if you're in small spaces, for sure, you want to have multifunctional um, furniture that's going to do that. So, uh, you know, chairs and, and um, ottomans, things like that, that can do double duty. That always works really good. Uh, the next point, think to yourself. What makes me happy or gives me good feelings? This one's really hard for a lot of clients because, you know, they feel like, well, so-and-so gave this to me, and I feel like I really need to keep it. And then my next question to them is, do you really think their intent was to make you feel guilty about having this item for the rest of your life? And then they usually stop and say, well, no, I guess not. I never thought of it that way. Well, I said you're just putting you're putting too much guilt on yourself. You know, if you really appreciate this item, take a picture of it. You can always have it put into a you know a frame, whatever you want to do if you really want to remember it, but you really don't want to keep the item anymore. Um, you know, take that picture and and right now, I mean, there's all kinds of different websites out there that will take all your pictures and put it into a book for you. So you could have a book of memories that have all your pictures of items that you, you want to remember, but you don't necessarily want to keep those items anymore. So um, 
So when it comes to guilt and keeping items, you really have to think that through and and put yourself in the position, is this this item valuable enough to me that I'm going to use my storage space, my places in my home to, to put that item? I hope that makes sense to everybody. And sometimes, you know, maybe just another family member could use it. You know, I ask them, say, hey, you know, I've had this for 20 years in my house. I really don't have the space for it anymore. Would you guys like it? Um, and sometimes just by benefiting others in the community with, with donation. Um, you know, the charities that are out there do wonderful work and uh, benefiting them by donating some items is always a good thing to do. All right, so on the next page, we have decluttering to do's. So this is the, actually the um, nuts and bolts of, um, of organizing. So when, you, when I go into a home, you're um, doing the sorting process. And so you're going to have boxes or bins that are all set up, and you're going to have them labeled, either with a sticky note or you know, right, at, right on the box. Um, you're going to have a donate box, a gift to family and friends box, a keep box, a uh, toss and recycle, and then go to another place in the home. And the reason why you have all those categories is that way, let's say, um, so picture one of your worst closets that you have. Um, it may, you know, you may have stuff, you know, coming right out of there all the time. You know, it's probably the one closet you don't like to open because it's just so much stuff falling out. All right, so you get that closet. You put all these bins up and down the hallway. You got them all labeled. You're ready to go. You open that door. You pull the things out. One by one, you decide which which pile that's going to go into. Um, it, you know, it, is it something they're willing to let go? If it's a donate item, is it something you could see another family or friend using? Um, are you, do you still want to keep it? Do you have room in that closet to keep it? Does it make sense there? Uh, toss and recycle. You know, if it's something that can be recycled, then recycle it. If you if it has to go in the trash, then trash it. Um, and then if there's something in that, that closet space that belongs in another part of your home, put it in that box. Don't go running around the, the house trying to put things away at that point because you're taking all of your energy doing that and then you get back to the closet and it's still full of things. And then you might have gotten you know, distracted um, in that other room putting that other item away and you walked in that room and went, well, what was I doing again? <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has that happen, but I'm going to be 50 next year and, you know, that more frequency of, frequency of that happening is more and more. <laughs> so, um, so anyway... Um, so those are the categories of sorting. Now, let's say you've gotten through that whole closet space and you have things all in the boxes and now you're like, what do I do with it now? Well, the first thing you have to do is you put the donate items right into your vehicle right away because you're going to make sure that that gets there to that donation site. And with it sitting in your hallway for the next week and a half, you're probably going to trip over it, you're going to be irritated by it, but you ne necessarily will not act on it. This way, if it's in your car and you see it and you have it right there, you can drop it off maybe on your way to work or dropping somebody off to a doctor's appointment or whatever. Um, and there are donation apps out there that you can use. I use um, It's Deductible. Um, it's a, um, um, through Intuit. And it's uh, a donation app where you're just plugging in the actual item, and it, it actually figures all that out for you. And it can be um, printed out at the end of the year so you can have it for your tax purposes. So I tend to do that for a lot of my clients when I um, drop things off for them. I get the donation sheet. I've already put that in the app, and I connect it, um, you know, staple it, and then I give it to them the next time. So it makes it real easy for them. But for your purposes, you're going to just um, make sure that you have things written down because it has to be in new or excellent condition, uh, or not new, good or excellent condition, sorry about that, uh, for that to be you know, tax deductible. And of course, you want to consult your tax person on all of that and how that would apply to your taxes. All right, so then you have the items that, are, uh, that have to go to another place in the home. So that's your homework, actually. Uh, that's where you have to go and put those things away in those different areas. Well, the most, <laughs> the, one of the questions I get usually is, well, what if those areas are already full of stuff and now you're putting more stuff there? And my point is, as long as you have zones 
set up for each item um, in your home. So you have one section, let's say, for all your cleaning supplies, and you have one area for all of your office supplies, and you have, um, you know, in your bathroom, you have all your personal care area items. Go ahead and put those things with those particular zones because at least it's getting to the spot where it needs to be. And then you're going to tackle each of the other areas one by one. You don't want to do it all in one day unless you feel like you're an energizer bunny. Um, but you'll want to tackle it little by little because then um, once you chip away at it, you'll be able to have a more organized space. Um, and then don't forget to put your uh, giving to the family and friends. Maybe that you can put by your front door. Um, so the next time you see them, that you'll give it to them. Or sometimes people like to put those right into their vehicle as well so they remember to distribute um, where it needs to go. Um, and like I mentioned before, sometimes you can use holidays as a time to give um, heirlooms or treasures to other family members or friends. And um, one of my friends, Beth Mann, she works for uh, uh, Green Ridge Realty. She's a senior real estate specialist, and um, her her little thing that she says a lot, and I know this is like a quote I've heard out there as well, um, do your giving while you're living so you're knowing where it's going. Um, so you can see the other, other people appreciating those items. Um, and then, of course, you want to make sure you take out the trash and the recycle to the, the waste area right away. You don't want to have a big trash bag sitting there in your hallway um, for you again to trip over. So you want to get that out right, right away. And then the keep items that you have. Um, you look and see, okay, do they have a purpose in place back in this closet? Um, and then you want to organize those items into similar um, zones. So one part of your closet maybe has a bin or you're going to put your hats and your gloves. And maybe you got one, one container that's going to hold all your umbrellas. And then you have all your, your jackets um, hung up in there. And maybe you have um, over the door rack where you have your shoes that are on there, and you maybe sort those out by um, family member. So the top of the, the uh, over-the-door hanger, you have your husband's shoes, or you have your wife's shoes, or then you move your way down, and you can label it according to the, the person. I hope that makes sense. All right, and then to the next slide, options for moving on your stuff. This is a um, frequent question I get as well. What What's the best way? to move my stuff that I don't want anymore. Well, uh, a lot of people like to do garage sales, and I've actually set up about six of them so far this year. Um, some were big, some were small. Uh, you do a lot of work, as you probably know, when it comes to setting up a garage sale um, for medium to low return, because you know most people want to work a deal when it comes to garage sale pricing. The next option would be estate sales. Um, that's a good option if you have a lot of items, maybe that are a little bit more, worth more than what garage sale value is. Um, you have to pay a per percentage to the uh, estate sale company. And uh, these days, there's online estate sales as well, where uh, you know you'll, they'll take the pictures of the items. Um, they'll do that for auctions as well. Take a picture. You know, they'll do a, like a posting fee, and then they'll also take a percentage of what it sells for. Um, I'm seeing a lot more advertisements out there that there's companies that will come in and, you know, just take everything from the household and then put that online and then sell it off that way. So sometimes that can make it a little bit easier on the family. Um, looking for a reputable estate sale companies, um, this was the, the website that I, I saw that was um, related to this, um, it's like a accreditation kind of situation or association. Um, for the estate sale companies. Uh, like I mentioned, auctions can be a good option too if you have large items that are valuable. Uh, a lot of times when I'm going through an estate with clients, we are separating things out as we go as far as what kind of looks like it's going to be more estate sale, what's going to be auction, um, you know, what's definitely for garage sale. After doing this for so many years, um, I kind of know which is you know, going to need to have some appraisals and, and what's a little bit more valuable if the client themselves don't remember what those items are. Um, so it can, it can definitely be worth it to, to you know, have an auction a company come in and you know, take a look and see if you have enough to, to do an auction that makes it worthwhile. 
Um, and that website there is um, also auctioneers.org is where they can you can find some reputable auction companies. Uh, donation, I'm going to mention that already. It's a good option if you want to move out items fast and get a tax deduction if that applies to you. Um, and then just look for charities that are well known in your community. And the you know the the you got the big ones, the well known ones, Salvation Army, Goodwill. There's a lot of also smaller ones that maybe are doing really good work in your community that um, are benefiting, but let's say low income. Um, housing or, you know, Habitat for Humanity or you have um, some of the more religious groups that are doing um, uh, different events, too, to raise money. So you just kind of keep your eye out for what's a, a good option for a donation. Um, consignment stores, those are kind of, um, they've sprung up a lot, I know, around the, around the country as well. And they usually want things that are, are good, uh, you know, as far as condition and actually excellent condition they tend to like a lot more. Um, and then they want something that's in style, high value clothing and goods. Uh, they also have some places that will do consignment on furniture. Uh, they will usually take a percentage, the consignment shop will. And um, there's a, a website out there too that actually um, consignment shops can be part of and that's that um, narts.org that's listed there. So you just want to, you know, make sure that that, that uh, consignment shop has a good reputation and um, maybe some of your friends or family have used them. And then you got the online site, and it's a good option to get a lot for your money, um, or a lot of money uh, for the item. And the drawbacks can be that it can take a lot of time, you know, taking the pictures, um, you know, can be costly. Um, especially if you do things like uh, Craigslist, you may have some safety concerns with some of those stories that are out in the media. Just being careful on where you go to meet up to exchange money and the item. Um, you know, use your common sense as far as, um, you know, having people come to your home to pick up items. Um, it, can, it can definitely be something that you, you should be wary about. Um, I, when I'm posting items up for clients, I don't ever put phone numbers or addresses, anything like that. I always have just the automated um, reply to um, reply to the poster, you know, through the Craigslist option, and that way I can decide whether or not I'm going to send an email back using my own my own email and talk to that person to make sure they're legitimate. Um, some of the other options you can use are like eBay. I know a lot of people do that. Um, there's actually companies that will list everything for you to sell on eBay, and you know, taking um, a cut of that as well. Uh, there's uh, on Facebook. There's different garage sale sites too that you can actually take pictures of the items and then post it on on the website there through Facebook, um, and then people will bid on that. I was doing that last weekend when I was working a big three-day cleanout job. We were listing a lot of of these different items for sale, and then I had people responding back and forth, and there's like a whole lingo and a whole <laughs> whole culture to that. So um, you have to kind of know what you're doing a little bit on that. So maybe the sometimes the younger generation is uh, um, helpful with kind of getting started on that. Um, but it's a good good option to to try those garage sale sites. I actually use OfferUp as well. It's a site where um, it's, they, they try to, to what's the word? Um, they try to make sure that they know who the person is that um, is, is, I guess, registered on the site, and then you're a little bit more secure as far as doing transactions with the person. Now, I've I've done a couple of different selling of items, and it's worked out really great. Um, I didn't have any problems, and I actually talks through the app to the other person back and forth and um, it's it's worked out fine. Haven't had any issues with that. But again you want to use your common sense. If you don't want to meet up at your home so other or so the other person doesn't know where you live, you know, find a public place and um, meet up to exchange. All right. So the next area I want to talk to talk to you about is um, paperwork flow. And that will be the next slide. Uh, so setting up a paperwork flow. The, the main thing is you want to have a paperwork command center. Uh, that's where you would probably have a calendar 
uh, either paper, electronic, uh, some people have both, uh, whatever you're more comfortable with is, you know, having that right there central to um, where you are at all the time in the home. So uh, a lot of times it's on the main floor uh, off of the kitchen dining room area. A lot of people tend to have their, um, their calendars right there. Also, making sure you have all your office supplies there. Are they accessible, located in the different zones? You know, you have different places for your envelopes, your pens, pencils. Uh, you, you know, if you have your computer cords, the, everything's all right there. It's not spread out all throughout the house. Um, To-do lists, you can either have paper or electronic. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's a good reminder to have a to-do list right there in your your command center so you know exactly what you have to get done. Maybe it's a medical appointment that you have to get scheduled or you have to go um, pick up some something, you know, from the store. Uh, it can be um, on paper, like I said, or electronic. I tend to use, um, there's an app out there called any.do and I list all the items I have to do for the day and it also will do some reminders however you set it up in the, the phone itself um, in the app. You can set it up to, to go off at different times of the day to remind you to get the to-do list done. And I just mentioned that um, the location of your command center, you just want to make sure that's in the most used area of the home. Um, using an in and out block, outbox flow, so setting up files and zones for each category. Uh, these are the ones that I tend to set up a lot when I'm working with clients. So uh, you want to have an action file. So that's going to be anything you need to act on. Uh, that can Sometimes I put it in a red folder just so that you can um, remember and you see it. Like, oh, yeah, I've got to deal with this. So I'll make sure I put it in the red folder. Um, to be filed, that can just be a, um, a tray uh, where you can put things in there so you know you have to go file them. Um, a lot of times uh, filing, you know, can take some time and it can be, you know, kind of tedious. So um, just having a tray available for you to put the things in to keep everything together is at least a step toward getting it filed. Um, and then making sure you have a um, recycle, right, recycle box or a shred box right next to that area too so you um, have a place for the papers to go, um, especially when it comes to mail. I'm going to touch on that in a little bit. Uh, the next is your personal workspace. So if it's um, making sure that um, this is a functional space for you, is your desk big enough? Uh, do you have vertical wall spaces used? That means, you know, do you have a bulletin board up in front of you? Do you have a dry erase board? Something that you can write um, notes on, something you can um, tack up uh, paper, you know, reminders, uh, you know, Anything that you need to, to have in regularly to remind you of the task to do or wh whatever it may be. Um, that's vertical wall space. Um, desktop organizer, that would be, you know, you have access to all the little, the little things like uh, paper clips and uh, pencils, paper, uh, notepads, sticky notes, anything like that at hand so you can readily get to it and then um, be able to write your notes. Um, as needed. And then I mentioned the place for the to be filed papers to go. It's important that there's a place for it to be and so it's not spread around um, different areas of your home. And then the action folder zone, um, again, it can be the red folder or it can be something of just an area on your desk. That's your area where you know those are the bills I got to pay for myself, these are the bills I got to pay for mom and dad. I know that I need to um, make sure that these get done, so they're going to go on this part of my desk. Um, making sure you have an effective file system too. Um, file it, don't pile it is usually the, the lingo out there. Avoid making piles if you can. I know some people really like having piles on their desk, and they said, I can find everything, I can find everything I need to. Um, and sometimes they can, but it, it can be tedious to look through those piles. If you use the fi a filing system that's set up, um, you can color code a filing system. Um, you always want to make labels that make sense to you. Let's say an, uh, a tab for um, automobiles. Maybe that doesn't, doesn't ring a bell for you when you're looking for that particular folder. So you want to break it down to 
one for Toyota, one for your Chevy, one for your um, classic car, you know, whatever, whatever that category is, you want to make sure that that's labeled that way. Okay. Um, the next one is uh, the uh, thousand sticky note syndrome. Now, <laughs> I think everybody can visualize this. So you have like, um, let's say it's your bathroom mirror. I've seen this quite a few times. There's sticky notes going all the way around the mirror. And it has all different kinds of things on it. And it may be related to pick up dog food or it may be um, uh, make an appointment for eye exam. You know, it can be a thousand different things. So the thing is, though, if you don't take the sticky notes off of there <laughs> and do those um, as they come, you know, they become overwhelming. And it becomes like the thousand sticky note syndrome. And that's not helpful because you haven't really done anything to get to your goal. You just have a sticky note up there saying what that is you're supposed to be doing. So I have had some of my clients have actually made boards just a regular, you know, like a poster board, and have put their sticky notes on there. And what I've done is I've asked them to, like, separate it into zones. So there may be an action zone for these sticky notes on the left-hand side. The middle is maybe not as urgent, but it's things they want to remember. And then there's another section for um, maybe not, it's maybe kind of like an archived kind of um, thing. They want to get to it at some point, but there's no rush. So even just thinking of zones as far as sticky notes. Um, I know there's virtual sticky notes out there too that you can put on your desktop to remember things as well. Um, I just I would just caution you at about using a zillion of those. Having one piece of paper that has different um, items that you want to get done, in my opinion, is better than having a thousand sticky notes. All right. Um, I talked a little bit about technology. But um, is it your friend or is it your foe? Well, depending on the day, I guess, <laughs> it can be both. Uh, technology, when it works, it's wonderful. I mean, I use my iPhone, my iPad um, every single day. I love it. You know, but when it's not working or something is glitchy, it, it can definitely be a pain. And um, it's, sometimes it's not easy to, you know, get it fixed. You may have to have a, a tech person look at it. Um, so there's, there's good, and pot, good and bad things to it. Um, it can definitely be good for tracking appointments, uh, your medication schedules, uh, regular schedules, you know, so if you happen to be in the sandwich, sandwich generation where you're taking care of elderly parents as well as maybe your own kids that are growing up, um, you have so, you know, several schedules that you have to juggle. Uh, like I said, keeping it all in one spot is going to be more advantageous to you than breaking it up. Um, so at least you have a listing of what's going on every day. You know, it can be different um, apps that are out there um, for technology. And it, it, uh, I kind of go into that in the next page. So why don't we go to the next slide on time management tips. And that's um, by using a master calendar. That's where you can either uh, do a color coding of per person, so maybe um, you're, you're the caregiver for your dad, so you make dad's color red. Or you make your color yellow, um, your kid's color green. So on your dry erase board that's broken out by, by day of the week, you can write in there per color as to what's going on with that person. I actually do that personally with my own board uh, because my family's trying to track me of wherever I am per day, <laughs> you know. I may be at three different clients and they want to know, you know, when exactly I'm going to be around. Um, or I need to know um, where my 21-year-old is at. You know, maybe he's, he's going to write in that he's got a doctor appointment. You know, just how you, how you set it up. Color coding is one, one great option. Um, I know a lot of people use um, Google, Cal Google Calendar to uh, actually track um, if you're a techie family and you like to have everybody um, on the same calendar, uh, you can do that um, just by, you know, making sure everybody's synced up and uh, all their activities are um, on the calendar. Outlook also through um, Microsoft has, has some options to do that. There are different apps out there, like I mentioned. Um, Any.do is one that I tend to use. 
and Cozy and Wonderlist are a couple of other ones. Um, I just want to say, because I want to make sure you guys have time for, for questions as well, um, that auto pay and electronic payments um, are definitely things you're going to want to do to get set up uh, just so it's uh, eliminating some of the uh, issues with maybe late payments, overdue payments, that kind of thing. If it's done automatically, um, it tends to make things a little bit easier, but you want to track what those items are that are getting paid automatically so you know. Um, and, and in case something happens to you, someone else has a listing of what all those auto payments are. Um, and I got a list, listing on the left side for junk mail. That's uh, uh, There's three, di three different categories there. Uh, DMAchoice.org is the direct marketers. So if you take any little tidbits from me today, um, I would do these. Uh, get off of the uh, direct mailers list. It's going to eliminate a lot of your junk mail. Um, just going through the website will help you do that. Uh, paperkarma.com is another option where you're actually taking a picture with your phone and it goes into the company and then they get you off the website. And then catalogchoice.com will get you off of catalog listings. So um, just <laughs> making sure that uh, you're, you're staying on top of all that, that junk mail that's coming. Um, and do your mail every day. It really helps. Um, the next page is talking about chronic disorganization and resources for older adults. So if you happen to have problems like um, um, ADD, OCD, chronic illnesses, mental challenges, hoarding, um, that's a big one. That picture you see there is actually of one of my clients that I've been working with. Um, hoarding disorder um, is actually um, in the DSM-5, which is a diagnostic manual for um, mental health professionals. And um, it's listed as its own disorder now. So um, the amount of attention it's getting is more, as well as from the TV show hoarders, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, I actually had the opportunity to, to serve on um, a couple of teams that uh, was actually, these episodes actually aired this month of July, the 2nd and the 16th. So I was behind the scenes and I got to see a lot of how the uh, TV show is, is done and um, the personalities, Matt Paxton and Dorothy Brenninger. Um, it was a great experience. I enjoyed it and um, just want you to know it's a team, team, uh, a team situation where you definitely have to have mental health professionals involved as far as counseling and, and dealing with the issues at hand with the individual. And uh, you definitely will want to um, check out the website, uh, Institute for Challenging Disorganization which is in the right column there, um, challengingdisorganization.org or childrenofhoarders.com. And that will give you a lot of information if you're dealing with an individual that has hoarding tendencies um, or straight out having a lot of hoarding issues, maybe a lifelong um, kind of situation. And then there's a list of resources there for um, if you need any help with um, services out there. Um, the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, Citizens for Better Care, um, the Administration on Aging through the, uh, the government. Um, and it was the very first one up there was the National Association of Senior Move Managers. And that's for anybody that needs help um, actually moving maybe into a senior living community. Uh, the next page is just a little um, about organizing tools and products. Um, I tend to go to the big box stores. Um, it's a big hot trend right now for organizing but you don't have to make it expensive. It can be um, finding items from dollar stores all the way up to um, Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, I tend to like um, Ikea as well and Target. The container store is one of my very favorite stores. Um, I love going there, but we don't have any in Michigan, so I always have to make that a trip. Um, but and if you have the chance to recycle and reuse, you know, I try to use reuse shoe boxes, food containers, that kind of thing, but make sure you don't save a thousand of them so you're not cluttering up your spaces. And then the next page talks about why you want to um, hire a professional organizer. And um, that's, you know, everybody's different as to how their family functions as far as, um, you know, how everybody gets along, if they're able to work through uh, dealing with the clutter and downsizing, then, you know, it usually goes pretty smoothly. But sometimes you need a third person, an objective person, that's been trained, um, and sometimes you know, just you know, having a transference of skills—that's what professional organizers do. We try to teach our clients 
to um, learn the skills so they're able to maintain the spaces. Um, and if there aren't any family or friends around, um, sometimes having that third party in there um, helps to, to keep an eye on the, the situation too. And uh, they, we do all kinds of different work, so um, I won't go into that, but you can read that as well, where it gives examples. Um, if you want more um, information about organizers, you can go to NAPO.net, which is the National um, Association of Professional Organizers. And then NAPO, Michigan is where I belong to. And uh, again, I mentioned the challengingdisorganization.org has a lot of information for the public as well as professional organizers um, who want to uh, learn more about chronic disorganization. And I want to thank you very much for listening. I hope you gleaned some good information from me. And if you have any questions, this is uh, how my, um, my particular uh, social media is set up. So you're welcome to, to check me out there as well. All Perfect. right, I'm all set there, Calvin. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Susie. Um, I certainly uh, appreciated your talk today. You know, I'm the kind of person, I hate to admit it, who gets personal mail and just kind of throws it in a box. And maybe a couple weeks later, I'll go through it all at once. And, but uh, there's, there's some good tips there. I was definitely, um, definitely uh, keeping, keeping my ears open for those. Um, <laughs> we do have some time for uh, a couple of questions. Uh, first off, I guess, um, you had mentioned that... Um, the recommendation would be 12 to, I think, 15 months to start a, um, a downsizing or decluttering on a house. Um, I guess in general, what, um, how long does it typically, typically take to downsize a home, an average home, let's say? Right, right. Um, well, it depends on how much they have me in there. I mean, if they need it to be um, done in a short amount of time. Uh, you know, if you're talking eight-hour days, you're, you're going to need um, probably at least a week's worth of time. Um, but a lot of times my clients hire me so that I, I'm doing the downsizing like uh, three to four hours every week. Um, I did one job, it was 13 months, another one it was eight months. <laughs> so, and if the family's helping, you know, it, it can go a lot faster. But um, typically, yeah, I mean, it, it's probably a good two to three hundred hours it can be. Serious work. Um, for um, here's a question. It looks like from uh, a caregiver. Uh, do you have any uh, tips or advice for someone who is a caregiver and maybe needs to uh, help a parent or uh, you know a relative or friend um, declutter um, and kind of you know uh, uh, get organized, but they are um, for whatever reason they're they're a little bit resistant or maybe very resistant. Do you have any tips or suggestions or maybe strategies on trying to get the two parties to see eye to eye? Right, right. I know that can be a, a huge challenge um, because that person um, probably is either in denial, um, they don't see the problem, or they uh, decide that uh, that everybody is out to get them. <laughs> you know, I've heard that <laughs> quite a bit too. Um, the important thing is to just uh, really sit down and, and come, come at it from a uh, perspective of I'm really worried about you in this situation. I'm not sure that this is the best place for you to be. Um, maybe we need to, to get some additional help here as far as getting some clutter out so you can safely move your wheelchair, your walker um, throughout those spaces. Um, you know, that's what I've, I've always recommended that the families um, do. Uh, you know, there, there's, you can't make somebody change unless they want to or there's uh, an absolute need to. Um, but, you know, trying to come at it from a, a loving, caring perspective, being defensive with the person is not going to work. Um, you know, saying, oh, you got all this crap, you need to get rid of it. <laughs> that's not really going to work. Yet, you know, coming at it from a more... Um, um, respectful and understanding perspective is going to get you a whole lot um, more progress. Great, great. That yeah, that certainly makes a lot of sense. And rather, yeah, that it being accusatory and you know, adversarial. That's actually yeah, really great advice. Um, I guess uh, uh, keeping on this this topic of um, trying to help out someone who who's maybe uh, has, has needs to get organized or is maybe a bit of a hoarder. Um, is there kind of a um, say a, a better time or kind of a good time when when do you think would be uh the best time to talk to someone about this to kind of bring this issue up 
about hoarding? Mm-hmm. Um, well, you know, because there is kind of the negative connotations out there with being called a hoarder, which um, I I really don't like that term either. I just think of as, of, as a person with hoarding um, disorder or a person with hoarding tendencies. Um, that way it's the person first and not the disorder. Um, that's the social work training in me. <laughs> um, but, you know, having that um, conversation and um, just providing that person with the resources. You know, just if you find somebody in your area that has expertise in dealing with hoarding or you know of a TV, the TV show or whatever, that will get that person to start watching and start seeing that maybe they have some um, similarities going on um, with what's going on in the show or um, just bringing them to a specific website. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of denial going on there and they're not, they're not ready to, to make that change. Um, but making sure that you're there providing the information and, and asking for those resources, uh, you know, little by little, I've actually, you know, seen progress with that with families presenting it. There's not a whole lot you can do otherwise because if they're not ready to change, they're, it, it's, you know, unfortunately, situations happen where the city starts coming down on the person or adult yeah, protective yeah. services. You know, all of that can happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, here's a question actually um, about um, products for organizing. I think, you know, you mentioned a couple of the big box um, you mentioned a container store, actually. If you ever come down and visit us in San Francisco, we have one right down the street, so you can, you can say hi, you can go to the can container store. But um, <laughs> I was wondering if you had any, uh, were there any particular um, kind of um, organizing product types that you enjoy? Uh, I don't know, cardboard boxes, plastic containers, internal dividers, are, are there things that, that you, you tend to recommend to clients um, that, that, you, you know, that you like to use? Yeah, I do. Um, there's actually um, some baskets out there that have um, handles kind of like on the front of them. Um, so like if, if you picture like a, a shelf that's up high and you need to grab the handle from the front part of the basket, that's where the handles are instead of on the top. Um, so they're easy to pull down and they're really good for anybody that maybe has some problems with, with hand, um, you know, gripping. Um, or a senior, a senior citizens too. You know, maybe it'll take. They can safely bring that down um, easier than a basket that may be tipping if they got to grab the edge of it. So I tend to get those. I've found those at Walmart Container Store has them. Um, even the dollar stores even have them now too. Um, and then all those little bins that you can get for sorting out pencils and uh, just li little doodads. They're they're in every store. They're good for drawer organizers, just depending on how you set them up in your drawer. I buy those all the time, using them for all my clients. Um, they're really basic, and they tend to work a lot in any type of drawer situation. Great, great, fantastic. Um, let us see. Uh, okay, well, here's a, a bit of a practical question. Um, a question on um, this listener is not from the, the Michigan area, so they, they can't give you a call. But um, for, for say, someone in California or, you know, other, other parts around the country, uh, how would you um, or what would you recommend uh, resource they would use to find a professional organizer and what should they be looking for to find someone who's qualified and who's, you know, is really good at their job? Right, right. Well, you're definitely going to want to go to the NAPO.net website and there's uh, um, searches that you can do right in there per state and you can find the, the individuals and what they um, specialize in, they, what they work in. Um, many of the, the organizers are also part of the Institute for Challenging Disorganization if they work with the chronically um, disorganized population. So anybody that's hoarding um, that has maybe obsessive compulsive disorder, ADD, um, all of those, you know, you're going to look for kind of both of those type of training. And then also for organizers, you have the option to get um, certified as a professional organizer um, if you want to do that. And then a lot of times the, the organizers will have some type of other um, 
uh, degree, like me with social work, ELC psychologists, there's nurses, um, coming from a variety of backgrounds, business as well. Um, there's a lot of specializations that go in with organizing, but um, you want to go to napo.net and you will be able to find people in your area. Okay, fantastic. That's actually quite interesting that um, a lot of the organizers do have um, kind of these dual um, uh, competencies uh, that that's, that they're you know some psychologists and things like that. It seems uh, it seems like a, a real benefit, like you know your background in social work. Um, <laughs> you know why not? I mean, get get all the expertise you can get. Um, <laughs> I think we have time for uh, one last question, and let us see. Okay. Um, this person would like to know if um, organizers would also work on clean out homes for um, is for an estate sale. Yes, they're actually. Um, it just depends on the organizer. Um, I have ac actually have done that. Um, I worked on an estate last year for about eight months um, by myself because the family was out of was out of state from where we were, and there was nobody else around. So I actually did twenty to thirty hours a week. Um, cleaning this out, so there there was a lot of stuff in there for sure. Um, so it it took me quite a while to get get that done, but um, but there, you can set it up where you either have that uh, a team of organizers go in and do it. Um, there's some businesses in the larger um, major cities that actually you know have multiple employees that they'll go in and do these kind of estate cleanouts as well. Um, it, it just has to be asked of that particular company how they how they work it, but I know many organizers do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I think that's all the time we have now for uh, questions. If you have um, any additional questions, you could call or email us or you could give um, Susie a call. Uh, her information um, I think is listed here. But just um, for the listeners, I have your links up right here. But could you please give your, um, your other contact information so they could uh, get in touch with you? Oh, for me? Yes. Oh, so you want to say that again? You kind of cut out a little bit on my end. Sure, of course. Um, just I just wanted to um, make sure everyone knew how to contact you. I have the, the, your, um, your Facebook information up, but um, do you have a, a business number where they could reach you at or a, a work email? Yes. Um, uh, you can reach me at, at my phone number is 616-554-3175. And you can uh, email me at info at suziesorganizationsolutions.com. And you can get to that email right through my website as well. Okay, perfect. Well, um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in t this month's webinar presented by Susie Marsh. Uh, please join us on August 26th for the importance of writing proper nursing notes for caregivers with uh, Erin Saracho. You can visit our website for more information, which is www.caregiver.org. Um, I'd like to extend our thanks to Susie. Uh, I think, as you've heard, she's uh, quite a busy person, weekends and evenings and all sorts of uh, very difficult work. I, I think you're gonna, you've seen some of the pictures, but you can imagine um, having that be your, uh, your job, to have to do this very difficult work of having to uh, organize other people's um, houses. Uh, I, so we certainly appreciate that she was able to take the time with us and to uh, spend this afternoon with us. Thanks again, Susie. The webinar is now concluded, and we hope to see you all next month. Have a great afternoon.